perhaps you could say that the miracle of the state of evolution of man is his ability to reach into any part of the universe and, and reach into the consciousness of any, any being in the universe. We experience uh, what it's like to get right into the consciousness of another being, like, for example, a person we love or a person who is very close to us or a person, even an acquaintance, of being able to reach another person. You see, the um, rishis and the gurus, um, dervishes and well, what one calls the holy men, are continually in contact with all beings and um, picking up um, thoughts from other beings. And as Hazrat Inad Khan once said, most of my work is done in the higher planes, he said. Most, that's where most of my work is done. And as a matter of fact, when he was uh, giving talks, for example, he would um, answer the questions of people without their having to ask the questions. And um, what is more, he would just uh, look at the person concerned so that it was quite clear that he was answering their question. And he was picking up things. For example, one day he um, could hardly speak. And um, he had to uh, curtail the lecture and go to his, the Orient room and in our home. And then um, uh, someone came and asked him, uh, Mushin, what happened? You know, it's never happened before. And uh, he said, oh, there's been a terrible tragedy somewhere in the world. And um, there are thousands of people who are just calling for help. And um, next day we read in the papers that there had been an earthquake in Japan and a thousand people were killed. And, you know, that was that big earthquake that was in 1924, I think. So one gets to a point when one is in contact with beings, you see. That's what we're trained to do, of course, in the Sufi order, of course. Uh, leaders have to... Um, meditate on each one of their pupils every day and at that time, of course, uh, pick up the, something about the condition of the pupil and um, um, so that if, uh, as a matter of fact, if he feels that something's going very wrong with the pupil, he should then um, write or send a message or telephone or something uh, to the pupil and, and um, so he's continually in communication. On the other hand, um, um, the teacher is supposed to be himself always in communication with those who are hierarchically above him and uh, be able to consult with them uh, for any questions which he can't um, settle himself. And so this um, brings, uh, this opens up a whole chapter in our, in the subject that we are talking about this week, and that is the spiritual government of the world. Um, you don't imagine that things just happen like that um, without being uh, prepared. Now I know that, well, of course there's a planning, and the planning it keeps on moving ahead. It's not a, like a, the, like everything is. Um, pre-planned, uh, but um, uh, the it's like an artist, as I said, who's continually changing his his idea as he paints his picture. But uh, there's more to it than that, as I said. If you remember, the planning has to take into consideration the, the freedom of people, and um, uh, so what is more, <laughs> one could say that it's like the planning of a composite being, so that. Uh, one says God, but uh, it's a term which we use, and uh, most of us don't know exactly what exactly we mean. Of course, there's a unity there, but uh, there's also a multiplicity, and uh, you can also think of it in terms of a composite being, and um, you can think of the, uh, let's say, that all events are somehow um, planned, although, as I say, not totally because one has to take into consideration the freedom of people by what is called the government of the world, or the spiritual government of the world. And that's a thought which um, maybe some people are not quite familiar with. It was very much in the tradition in the past. Uh, even nowadays, uh, if you go um, to um, certain countries, like if you, for example, Lahore or Karachi or 
Jerusalem, for example, Lahore is uh, the areas of Lahore are, let's say, divided uh, under the guidance of different um, dervishes. There's a dervish for each area of the town. It's like a sort of geographical uh, distribution of, of sovereignty. It's very strange. The, um, the person who's in charge of that area has a kind of responsibility to protect it and uh, to deal with any spiritual problems of people in that area and so on. The two, let's say, um, functions of those in who we call the members of the spiritual officers, let's say, of the spiritual hierarchy of the world, uh, one is uh, protection and the other is guidance. Protection, uh, perhaps you know in Jerusalem there's a tomb it's the tomb of a Sufi saint. Uh, it's a little street in Jerusalem, and you'll notice that as people pass um, through this street, they always bow before this it's a little window, fenced window. And if you look through the window, you'll see a, a green sarcophagus covered with a green cover and a few flowers there. And he is uh, considered like the patron of Jerusalem, like the the protector. Now, he was a very extraordinary figure. He used to, was like a St. John the Baptist figure. Uh, he used to live in the desert, and then he would come out and harangue the, the masses of people and uh, sort of awaken them to their their conscience. And, and uh, people used to um, ask for his blessing and his protection and so on. He had a great influence upon uh, Jerusalem at that time. Well, when you realize, of course, Jerusalem is the heart chakra of the world, and you realize what the condition of the world at present is reflected in its heart, which is being torn at this particular moment. You realize the importance of Jerusalem. Now, another example of the uh, government of the world is Gandhi. Now, I remember that when Gandhi was shot, you know that Gandhi actually bowed before the man who shot him, as though to say, uh, please, Forgive me for not having convinced you of the of the meaningfulness of my of my theory of nonviolence. And Gandhi, well, I remember hearing the news in the papers. There was a housewife in in, in England. I was in London at the time, who was in tears. And I said, "Well, why does it mean so much to you? I mean, I'm very deeply affected by it, but why does it mean so much to you?" She said, "Yes, well, he's." Um, his his somehow his being has has affected my life. Uh, so I, I said, well, how how has it affected your life? Said you see, she said it's um, because he taught nonviolence, and uh, it's made all the difference to me. Mm -hmm. Well, now let's say we can say that then the being of Gandhi reached millions of people, perhaps billions of people, I don't know. But anyway, you can say that he had an influence upon people, and that's what I'm trying to say, that what we mean by an officer in the government of the world is someone who is exercising an influence upon people, and uh, this influence goes in a certain direction. For example, you could say that if we look at uh, the procession of human thinking from the beginning of history, you'll realize that there's not only just an evolution in the species, you know, like from the mineral to the vegetable and so on, but there's definitely a forward march in the thinking of humanity. It's gone through different phases. Uh, there's definitely, there's what we call the trend, for example, you could say there's a trend in our time, like I'm talking about the holistic age. What do I mean by that? It's a trend. Now, it's not the invention of a person, but um, if everything is planned, as I said, let's say they are behind, uh, let's say, the masses of people with all their various thoughts, there's a kind of coercive thinking that is a, a planning. I don't say that the planning is completely separate from the thinking. There's a, how can you say, there's like group consciousness, uh, you can, for example, you could form, we could form a group of people, as I have done sometimes in past um, meetings, um, seminars, a whole group of people, sort of 12, 13, 15, 20 people, walking in a group, and 
they let themselves just be led by the feeling of the group. And without anybody leading, you know, it's a um, thing you can do, you can try it. And you see that that group def definitely develops a trend. Now, if you look within the group, you will find that maybe there's no one who's leading, but there's maybe at one p time there might be one person who makes a move that is a little bit in a certain direction, and then the others follow. In any case, there's such a thing as group consciousness. What I'm trying to say, there's such a thing as group consciousness, but then there are people who incorporate group consciousness. It's very difficult to say just how this planning takes place. Uh, if you um, study science, for example, biology, you know, one used to say that, um, in biology, one used to say that the species adapt themselves to the environment. Well, now biologists are realizing that the, uh, it's not, on, not only this is true, but that the species adapt the environment to their sense of purpose. And so uh, somehow we, deep down in the consciousness of humanity, there's a sense of purposeness. And there are beings who seem to be more clearly endowed with the trend, the sense of the trend than other people. And those are the pioneers, like uh, the American Revolution and so on, all the, the people who just seem to just have a feel for the next step, like they give a, a sense of direction. And then others concur with that because they see that that direction is, is right and they will sort of help them. And there's a sort of mass movement in that direction. That's what we mean by the government of the world. So it might, it does not necessarily mean that it's just made up of people whom we call spiritual, whatever that means. It might be a politician, it might be a, a musician, it might be a scientist, it might be a, an unknown person. But somehow, behind the scene, I'd say there's much more programming than one would ever have thought. There are things which are very, very most surprising. For example, when I was much younger, and then about 20 years ago, or 30, 30 years ago, I um, was uh, visiting, um, well, it was Badrina, as a matter of fact, one of the pilgrimage uh, places on the, on the, uh, next to the Ganges, next, very, not very far from the source of the Ganges. And uh, I was very green, I mean, it was very new to it at that time. And... Um, there was a rishi sitting next to the hot water spring, and uh, there were masses of people there. And uh, in those days, it was fantastic. the The experience of the pilgrimage into the source of the, Gan of the Ganges in India was something absolutely unique. Nowadays, it's just spoiled. You know, I went to Barina two day two years ago, and it just wasn't the same. It was, uh, you know, you can get there by bus, and uh, <laughs> tourists go there. And you know, so. it was in those days, of course, you had to. Well, first of all, a train from Delhi, and then five days bus, every day bus, and then you had to walk for at least five days until you got to Badrina. And if you were got to Gangotri, of course, it would take ten days walking, and you had to walk the whole day. As I said, here he was, sitting there, and I uh, was, um, there, there was such a, uh, how can I say, euphoria, you know, where everyone was, there was a man reading the Upanishads next to the temple, uh, crying tears of joy, <laughs> uh, people singing and playing, uh, the, playing all kinds of musical instruments and dancing and oh, the whole atmosphere was just incredible. And here was this Rishi and um, people were bowing their heads in the sand in front of him. And um, I was looking, I, the first time I'd seen anything quite like that. And uh, so I didn't know exactly how to I couldn't see myself going then bowing before him. It was um, so. I I don't think I would like myself you know, as I was then. <laughs> <laughs> I was, this, you know, this Oxford uh, thing. <laughs> <laughs> Very elegant, you know, shaved, and shaved. <laughs> and well, then um, I. Um, so he did, uh, I, I sort of greeted him at a distance. I saw he looked, kept on looking at me, so I greeted him at a distance, and then he said, <laughs> so <clears throat> I came and sat next to him, and, um, well, 
I asked him all kinds of questions, and he kept on, well, he seemed to want to talk to me, and everybody was bowing and leaving, and I kept on talking with him. And um, so, well, in the course of the conversation, I remember saying to him, oh, yes, yes, he said to me, uh, yes, Badrinath is one of the petals of the Ajna Chakra of the world, and... Um, uh, Kailas, which is in Tibet, just over the border from India to Tibet, is the uh, crown center. And um, he said, I've been called upon to sit here. And one day I will, I will be called upon to go to Kailas. So I said, well, how will you know when you have to go to Kailas? And he said, um, well, when the time comes when I have to do it, I will be given the sign. So, well, it's a typical Indian answer. <laughs> so it didn't give me much information. But the curious thing was that then I started, um, uh, well, making a pilgrimage, um, uh, going higher up in the mountains, because, you see, the reason why I went there at all was because my father had said, when I was a child of 10 years old, because my father died when I was 10 years old, he said, um, the, if you want to see the great rishis in India, you will find them at the place where the Ganges and the Jamna meet, at, at their source, at their source. So I looked at the map, I saw that the Ganges and the Jamna meet in Allahabad, which is not at their source, it's somewhere along the way down below. And then I looked at the map, map and I saw that indeed uh, there's a place where the sources are very close, but then they don't absolutely contiguous, they're very close. Um, Gangotri, uh, Gangotri and um, Jamnotri. So I um, mm. tried to see which is the nearest train station and took, just took a train to the nearest train station, which was Rishikesh, and then from Rishikesh, so then we, uh, um, of course, on the train I met someone who said, where are you going and what are you doing? So I said, uh, well, I'm, uh, my father said that the Rishi he found there, so I just thought this is the way. So he said, well, yes, of course, this is the great pilgrimage. All of the people of India, they always want to make a pilgrimage to the holy shrines along the, this, in this area here. It's wonderful that you're going there. <clears throat> and um, then, um, well, I was very lucky in, to meet the Raja of Terry Garwal, who um, uh, invited me as his guest. He was the president of the Temple of Badrinath. And of course, I talked to him all along the way, and it was a great help. And it was a great help because, and in those days, of course, it was well. I was likely to be arrested any moment. For um, in India, you know, they're always suspicious of anybody. For me, I seem to be like a foreigner in India. <coughs> so, um, so then. Um, Having gone to Badrinath, and I went to Kedanath, and then I went higher up, and still higher, and so on. And in fact, I met a rishi who, in a little, a little like a dog's kennel. I mean, it wasn't big enough to stand up in a very small place. There was the other side of Badrinath, of the river of Badrinath. There were lots of rishis sitting, sannyasins sitting, uh, meditating. It was uh, just you couldn't believe it, and. Uh, uh, cross over the river, and then there were about a group of about fifteen sannyasins uh, holding an enormous rosary. There were about a thousand uh, beads to the rosary, big beads like that, and they were all saying Ram, 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 Ram. And then they, when they saw me, they said, "Come along and join us." And <laughs> all, all said Ram, Ram, Ram. And then in the uh, there was a, as I say, there was a rishi in a little cave, and he said, uh, "Where are you going?" So I said, uh, "Well, I'm looking for the place where the Ganges and the Jamna meet." So he said, "How do you know that the Ganges and Jamna meet?" So I said, "Because my father said so." He said, "But that's very little known, because I mean, the, uh, I mean, officially, the the source of the Ganges is in Gangotri tree and." Uh, it's called Gomuk, and the source of the uh, Jamna is in Jamna tree. He said, yes, your father was right, but um, it's very little known that um, 
higher up beyond Gangotri and Jamnotri, there's a place there where the where actually the two rivers are just one, there's one source. So I was on my way up, of course, um, very difficult. In fact, I walked three days in the snow and ice and um, caught my, well, pneumonia. And um, um, I came across this very great Rishi who was sitting in, uh, in the middle of the snow, well, in the cave, but the, the, the cave was in the middle. Actually, I saw footsteps in the snow, and I thought it was the footsteps of a bear. And bears are very dangerous in India. They hug you to death. <laughs> That's a place where hugs are quite dangerous. So I thought, well, I've come this far, and, uh, you know, I... Perhaps it isn't a bear after all. I'm not. I don't. I'm not very good at identifying pug marks. So I followed it up, and there indeed was a great rishi who was sitting in this cave. And uh, so uh, um, I saw that he did this movement like this. So I thought he meant don't come in. So I sat in the snow outside. I was so wet it would I couldn't have been wetter anyway. And um, I was trembling with my cold and. Um, but still, I, I closed my eyes and meditated, and I don't know, it, may, it might have been a long time, because I really uh, f forgot myself altogether. And when I opened my eyes, he was smiling at me, and he said to me, Why have you come so far in order to see what you should be? So I said, Well, it's wonderful to see it. Uh, and he said, You've already seen it. I said, yes, and my father. He said, yes, your father is your guru. I said, yes, my father is my guru. I'm not looking for a guru. He said, if you're not looking for a guru, come in. That <laughs> 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 was fantastic. And um, <clears throat> then, of course, he sent me back again because I was in a bad, very bad state. And um, he said, you can come back again. And when I got back, of course, I was, I didn't know I was going to tell you all these personal stories, but uh, I was back, there was about, on my way back to, uh, let us get another, there were uh, about ten policemen there waiting for me. <laughs> I was under arrest for having gone to that area, which was kind of military area in those days, still is a little bit now. And um, so then, after being questioned and questioned and questioned and so on, I had to, well, I had to go to the clinic and... Um, and I, there was all those policemen watching over me, and uh, so I had to um, uh, slip out of the window in the middle of the night and <laughs> get back up there again. <laughs> now he was the one who, uh, he only gave me, um, uh, he was very, very severe, he was very severe, very, almost, not, how can I say, not communicative at all, he would just... Um, he was, um, f let's say, frigid. He was kind of um, uh, like made of ice. <laughs> he was living in the snow, you know, and his whole being was... <laughs> and he would uh, just say, yes, all right. And yeah, he said, concentrate on opening the heart chakra with the third eye. And that's all. You know? And then come and see me when the sun is in the zenith, and come and see me when the sun is setting, and then come and see me at dawn. Because there's no watches, of course, so that's the only way to tell the time. And then sometimes he would uh, not even notice me. <laughs> and uh, then uh, and he opened his eyes and he saw me, he'd say, you go back again. <laughs> and you go back to another cave somewhere. And uh, sometimes I asked him questions and he didn't even answer. And uh, so on. So, But um, after a few days he said, it's time for you to go back now. And uh, he said, um, you have a mission to fulfill, and um, so he said, um, mm -hmm. "I'd like you to tell people that um, that uh, well, there are very few of us remaining, and uh, the reason is because the air is polluted, and that was thirty, maybe thirty-five years ago, mm -hmm. and we feel it here, about maybe fourteen thousand feet high, and." Um, he said, what is more, the minds of the people are polluted, 
And he said, you can't fight a war with war, with violence. He said, um, the only way to save the world is by telling people that um, the only the only alternative is love. And um, the times have changed now. He said, to, uh, as I said, there are very few of us remaining, but now it is necessary for it to be lots and lots of people who are dedicated to the spiritual ideal, and that's going to happen. And it's true, it has happened. Now, uh, I would say that he was one of what I would call one of the great officers in the government of the world. Now, um, after leaving him, uh, he had told me, now, you've got to go back, you see. Now, I was very young and disobedient, and I wanted to go higher up. <laughs> and um, so I tried to. And um, on the way there was someone, no, there actually there were two or three, yes, there were two or three people who came up to me and said, you can't go any further. And I was so amazed, I thought, well, how is it that those people have just been placed there. How would they know that I was going higher? And uh, this whole area is so divided that it's like, you know, uh, that the Rishi had told me that sometime I will be asked to go higher, you see, to sit in a place higher up. It's like everything has been ordained. And how it's organized, I don't know, but I can speak from personal experience. I was asked to go down, and that was it, and I was to obey the, the, the orders. So, these are a few indications of the government of the world. Um, now, Hasratinath Khan describes this government in the book called The Unity of Religious Ideals. It speaks about the different officers. It starts by the lowest of all the ranks, which is the peer, who is just responsible for one of the, um, for a community of people, uh, uh, an order. Uh, a kind of uh, an order which reflects the divine order, but which is a very, very poor replica of the divine order, of course. It's a kind of um, karmic responsibility for people. It's giving people a sense of direction. It's assuming some responsibility for people, protecting them against themselves sometimes. It's, um, that's the role of the guru, of course. <clears throat> Uh, it, that's what initiation means. It's taking upon oneself uh, some kind of a karmic responsibility for what people are doing and for their development and so on. You can never answer totally for a person, but still. Um, but um, <clears throat> then the next rank is Buzuruk, which means a great being, great being. <clears throat> um, it's, uh, well, occasionally perhaps you come across a being that you feel is a great being. You must, exactly as there are bigger stars in the sky and smaller stars in the sky, you know, there must be, there are differences in people and there are differences in their realization, in their dedication. I would say that uh, admittance to the spiritual hierarchy uh, depends upon one's um, uh, several things. One is, of course, one's readiness to dedicate oneself to service, and that means, of course, that it might be at the cost of a lot of things. I mean, in any case, certainly personal, um, uh, at the cost of personal, uh, any personal wish, of course. Sometimes personal wishes may be granted, but um, one has to accept that it's at the cost, of, it's always at the cost of the person. But it's not just dedication, it must, of course, it's based upon a tremendous amount of experience of of helping people, and also, of course, based upon the ability to uh, pick up intuitively the, let's say, the the guidance that is given. To, I mean, uh, you can't a, a guru. You think I mean, isn't there? Always has his own his hierarchic superior. He can't just do things on his own. He has got to all this. There are some things which one has to, uh, some uh, decisions one has to assume oneself, and there are other decisions where one has to consult higher up. And, 
And so it would be interesting if we could have some kind of a glimpse of what goes on behind the scene. Like you see things happening on this, uh, this theater uh, uh, scene of the world. But what goes on behind the scene, if one only knew, you'd be amazed. I'll try and describe it a little bit, in, in, as far as I can see, of course, these great beings, and really, you know, there's some reason why in the children's books of, uh, you know, about the Old Testament, the prophets of the Old Testament, and so on, somehow the artists are inspired to give you a kind of impression of the masters, and it's true, they, uh, so some of their um, uh, their uh, intuition is right, and somehow they they draw that inspiration from the depths of their soul somewhere. That, let's say, the archetypes of the great beings are present in the soul of each being. Like, really, you can find Buddha in yourself, and you can find Christ in yourself, and so on. Abraham, Melchizedek, you hear about them in books and so on, but somehow they also exist in what Jung calls the collective unconscious, and you can find them. I mean, you, you can find them in yourself. So, if I could describe it, it's very difficult to describe, but you could say it's like an assembly of kings. <laughs> There's no other way of emperors or something like that. <laughs> Incredible beings. And everyone is, the, although there's sometimes there's similarity like this, there must be some similarity between Moses and Abraham, for example, and yet somehow there are tremendous differences. Like there's a tremendous difference between Jesus and Buddha. And uh, the variety of beings is sometimes quite incredible, quite incredible. They're not all old men with white beards. There's some uh, very young beings and uh, very uh, im, how can I say, immaterial beings and others who are much more like human beings and so on. This, the number is, of course, infinite. Okay, I wish I could describe some of those beings, like um, there's that dervish um, Haji Sharif Zindani Chishti, who is continually dancing the whirling dervish dance. You always see him dancing, he's, he's always dancing, right? never stops. And in ecstasy, and uh, the, uh, his words are incredible, like, uh, you know, um, my feet are bleeding, uh, torn by the thorns of the world, and uh, do not come close to me unless your heart is pure, And but you have to come my way if you want to reach, if you want to drink the cup of a poison that gives divine ecstasy, and you know, these kind of words that are, you know, beyond the language of, and the thinking of only humans. And I don't know whether you know that um, you, uh, you, it was surprising that even in the higher planes there's, there's evil at an even more intense uh, rate than on the earth. It's, uh, it's difficult to believe, but uh, beings who are trying to destroy people's souls. You know. Now you know that Al Halaj was crucified. Not only he was crucified, but he was burnt. His body was burnt, and of course, in the Islamic and Jewish tradition, the body resurrects, and therefore the body has to be preserved. And so the the judges gave him the meanest of all possible judgments, so that he would um, the, to ensure that his soul wouldn't resurrect. And um, you know, then he, at a, at the moment when he heard that that he was his body was going to be burned. Uh, you know, it's never heard of, you know, you don't do that in Islam. You, the bodies are always buried. Uh, he had a terrible shock. You and then he, he prayed to God, he said, Oh God, how is it possible thou should have wished for my creation? And having wished for my creation, the creation of this body, thou should now wish for it to be annihilated totally. And then he hesitated a moment and then he said, Yes, it is an incense that is to be burnt as a promise of my resurrection. 
then he all of a sudden realized that it was the destruction of the body that was a condition of resurrection, not the keeping of the body. And that was absolutely against the orthodox view that it's the body that resurrects, you see. Well, now, as I say, there are beings who are trying to destroy the souls of beings so that the souls can't continue to live. So the struggles up there are, are incredible. Now, of course, when we say the uh, government of the world, we mean beings who are incarnated and beings who are not incarnated. Let's see. All being members of the government. And when we say the world, well, it's a very vague word. Like there are those who are, have, are in charge of the planet Earth and those who are in charge of perhaps not just the planet Earth but also uh, other planets like uh, and perhaps the whole planetary system, including the sun, and then perhaps other beings who are involved in the galaxy and so on. So there's no end to the variety of beings. And also it doesn't only include masters, but it also includes archangels and, and angels and jinns and so on. So of course there's no end. You can't, it's very difficult to define it. We try with our simple minds to try and get some idea about what these beings are. And that's why I say, well, start with the, a, a guru, let's say, the peel, someone who has some responsibility with regard to the spiritual lives of people. And then uh, the buzurg, who is a um, kind of very great being. Um, it's an interesting word because um, you know that one of the things that we've been trying to do in our meditations is to develop this sense of vastness instead of this sense of limitation of ourselves. And I think that's part of, that is what makes a great being, is because he becomes cosmic instead of being just a person. We're so concerned with personal problems. And in fact, one of the ways of meeting personal problems is to think of ourselves in our cosmic dimensions instead of keep on turning in circles with considering our little personal problems. The next rank is um, Wali. It means two things, as a matter of fact. It means the master and it means the friend. The the way that Hazrat Inadhan typifies the Wali is that he harmonizes all beings. So his in his presence, people are able to relate, to coordinate, to work together. As soon as he leaves, of course, then everything falls flat. That's happening all the time. Like a guru is there, and then there's a certain there's a group, and then the guru dies, and of course the group disperses. It happens all the time because um, it's just because he is able to harmonize beings because he knows how to maintain the order and at the same time get pe- so that means getting people to concur in the order of things without uh, while most people just don't want to. I mean everybody wants to follow his own way. <clears throat> so it's only people who are held in great regard, who are able to maintain harmony in a group. Well, that's the wali. It has to do with a kind of a, um, a sense of harmony, of course, a sense of harmony in the universe, a way of harmonizing people by one's being, and a way, and of course, a kind of sovereignty. Now, um, you know, there are some people whom you feel respect for and whom you would follow, even if you weren't, even if you would quite understand them, what they want, but uh, you still follow them because you have respect for them. So the Wali has that quality about him, which, you know, he is a higher rank, of course, than the Buzur, and it's generally in charge of a larger community, like uh, maybe not just a city, but uh, perhaps even a country. <clears throat> So there's two things, there's the geographical distribution and also the the rank, see. The higher the rank, generally the larger the distribution, but there's also other things to consider, like the particular sphere of activity that, that, that he's in charge of. And then you have the, um, <clears throat> the rose, which is a very, very high rank. The rose... Uh, you know, there's the Abdel Qadjilani in, in Baghdad is always called Rosi Azam. Ros means, well, it's a very high rank. It's someone who has the gift of ubiquity. That means he has the 
uh, the gift of being able to be in several places at the same time, um, he's everywhere. And uh, um, you think you see him there and there. <laughs> you, know, there it seems. you know, that was what was said of Babaji, that um, he was found in one city and at the same time he was seen in another city at the same time. And it's a quality that you find in Osiris, for example, in Egypt, and Dionysos in Greece. It's a certain quality that you find in certain great beings of being able to appear and disappear in various places. There's a very wonderful word of a poem of um, um, of Shams Tabriz, who says, um, "How is it possible that you and me, that means Dilawulri and me and me, we're sitting here, and yet your body is in Khorasan and my body is in Tashkent." <coughs> And it's here we are. And exercising some kind of action in any part of the world. And as I said, it's the you see the plant, for example, the tree, is unable to move, but um, so but the animal is able to move, his body is able to move, but his consciousness is centered in the bo- in the body of the animal. Whereas the human being not only can he move his body but he can move his consciousness out of his body. It's a, neck, it's a further degree of, uh, in evolution, it's a further advance in evolution. And the higher the being is, the more free he is to move his consciousness beyond his body. That's the whole. And that means entering into the consciousness of other beings. For example, your body is sitting here, and you are able to experience what so-and-so is experiencing over there. And uh, so that's the reason why the rishis can sit in a cave. They don't have to be in the middle of a city. They don't have to need a telephone and so on, because they can reach any person anywhere and exercise an influence upon. You can say, well, how can they have a protective influence upon people? Does that mean they don't have to go and give talks on television and so on to influence people? They are able to reach people at a distance. Uh, then beyond that, there's the Kutub. And the Kutub is, um, let's say, the highest rank in the hierarchy, according to the Sufi um, terminology. Now, uh, this is not just a tuf- Sufi teaching. You find it um, in different traditions. It's generally kept very, very secret. Um, as a matter of fact, um, when I, in my conversation with uh, Mahesh Yogi in uh, Silisberg in Switzerland, um, he was particularly interested in this question because he knew how it had been taught in Hinduism, but uh, for him it was quite new, uh, you know, what the Sufis had to say about it. He kept on telling his pupils, now note it down, note it down, no. and kept on asking me, can't you stay a little longer? I'll get a helicopter to take you to the show, but stay a little longer. <clears throat> Well, now the Kutub, um, let's say, is the highest rank normally. Let's say, occasionally, then you have a prophet who comes, and that's something of a different line altogether, different category altogether. Like, you know, when the prophet comes, then he changes the order of things altogether, like the influence of Christ or, or the influence of Muhammad, like imagine that they, I don't know how many, a very large section of the universe, of the, of the planet, is, is Muslim. Like, they would um, do anything because the Prophet had said so, they would do it. So he, you can say that he really exercised a very great influence on people and uh, it, uh, brought about a new culture and so on. I mean, tremendous influence. Well, that's, of course, another thing, but it's a very special line, the line of prophethood. There are actually the three lines, according to Hazrat Inat Khan, the line of the master, the line of the saint, and the line of the prophet. And um, so, the let's say, the way of mastery, of course, the way of the master, and that's what we've been, I've been teaching. Uh, the way of the saint is, well, a wonderful example of the way of the saint is Mother Teresa of, of Calcutta. That's the way of the saint. And then the 
is the way of the prophet, and that's, as I say, it's a, occasionally there's a being who comes and, you know, brings about a total change, like a real quantum leap. <laughs> but um, there are uh, minor prophets, too. And um, although the two ranks of the prophets, as uh, Hazrat Inal Khan describes, yet yeah, Nabi and Rasul, they, they constitute were very high beings, um, still, I think that um, um, it, it, the way the Prophet includes people of a far lesser rank who are dedicated to, you know, dedicated to helping humanity, like in whatever way, uh, uh, to bring about a change. Like anybody who feels like this is it, the time has come now to, for example, to form a commune and to find a better way of living and, and um, show people how they can better their lives and so on. He's a member of the prophetic order, I think. And uh, I think that we're living at a time of prophethood rather than a time of masterhood, I think. That's the new way, is the way of the prophet instead of the way of the master. So let's say the Qutub is the highest in the uh, incarnated master on the planet, on the line of the masters. Kutub means the, like the, the point at the top of a dome, for example, like the dome of a mosque. The kutub is the top, like the pole. So he's the pole of the hierarchy, though, of the pyramid. Mm. Uh, the pole has displaced itself uh, in the last last years quite uh, rather fast. And in the last few years, um, the Qutub was um, a very great rishi in um, above um, Gangotri. As a matter of fact, just in that area that I was trying to reach, <laughs> and um, which is, you know, hardly anybody ever goes there. It's very high in the snow, and uh, it's very high mountain passes. Very difficult to reach. Uh, he was uh, one of, let's say, the greatest Rishi in the last um, 20, well, the last 10 years. What, uh, what is it to prevent people from meeting great beings? Well, I suppose it's like, um, you know, not easy to visit President Carter. Uh, it's not because he doesn't want to meet you, but it's because he's just very busy. I mean, if he met every American, he'd never have time to do his job. So there has to be some kind of protection. Now, you know that there's a tradition of the rishis that they're supposed to be there for darshan. That's, the word darshan means that uh, like they're to communicate to their state of consciousness. And uh, people are supposed to uh, be able to come at any time. It's, it's a kind of rule. You know that um, uh, Ramana Maharshi was perhaps one of the greatest rishis of the last, uh, let's say, 20 years ago. And um, he was, oh, he was such a wonderful being. He was always in ecstasy. He was always in Samadhi. Always people came, people left, and he was sitting in Samadhi. And uh, people asked, can we... Uh, can you be my guru? And he said, no, 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 God is the guru. I'm not the guru. Or your higher self is the guru. And um, he'll just inspire people by his being. And the, the only philosophical statement that he ever made was, who am I? And people said, well, how can I reach illumination? And he said, who is you when you say I? What do you mean by I? to reach illumination. <laughs> well, he, um, in the last years of his life, he was, as I said, he had cancer in the arm, and um, the doctor said that he should not keep sitting there all the time. He should uh, have a time after lunch when he would be able to have a nap. And um, so his brother, who was in charge of the ashram, um, put a lock on the door so that people wouldn't be able to come in so that he'd have a, be able to have his nap after lunch. And um, lo and behold, they found him sitting on the doorstep. <laughs> <laughs> and so his brother said, well, uh, if you didn't want to, uh, me to have the door locked, well then 
I would be glad to do whatever you wish. And he said, I don't have any orders to give to anyone, but I have to follow my dharma, which means that my the, the law of the rishi is he must be available at any time. So I have to follow my rule, you see. Gandhi, for example, and Gandhi was um, used to sleep um, as they do, you know, on these sort of uh, straw beds uh, in the open. So it's very hot in India. And masses of people used to come and bring their beds and sleep next to him. He was always, so they could be in his presence. Always, that's, that's the rule. So uh, my question is, of course, well now, what is it then that prevents one from coming across beings, great beings? Why are they protected? Well, I know some rishis in the caves in the Himalayas, and they say to me, please don't tell anyone where I am because um, uh, they have sought for shelter so that they can do their work, and if they're being disturbed all the time by people, they can't. So there are masses of people who go to India hoping to visit a great rishi, and they come back disappointed, and they say, oh, well, it's a legend of the past, there aren't any rishis in India. And of course there are, but they're hidden in their caves, and where are you going to find them? <clears throat> like you might have heard about one, and you go there and you find that he's not in his cave anymore because uh, people have come, started to come and visit him and now he's gone further in the jungle because he's not going to stay there any longer. So I would do harm to a rishi by, by showing his whereabouts because then he would have to move further into the jungle and he might not find as nice a cave as the one in which he is at present. <laughs> <laughs> now there's some who haven't asked me yet, so I can still... And do it, but maybe I I will have to ask them because I'll spoil it otherwise for them. But there's a kind of rule, as I said uh, already. The the cruder forms are, of course, the the Madzub who um, throws stones at you if you come anywhere near him. That's a rather crude way of protecting himself. <laughs> or then, <laughs> or there's the one who who points at you and says. Don't come anywhere near me. <laughs> uh, stay there, stay there, stay there. Don't come anywhere near me. <laughs> and then some, some, sometimes they say, yes, come along. And, or then there's a group of people and say, you can come. And the others, you stay away. <laughs> but um, as for the beings who are disincarnated, then of course one could say that it's a little bit like a question of altitude, like what altitude are you able to stand? Like uh, it's a little bit like, as I said, there was those people who said you can't go any further, any further up. You see, it's a question of altitude. Are you able to stand a high altitude, and let's say the atmosphere of a great being? That's why they say, "I'll burn you. Don't come near. I'll burn you." Are you able to stand their power? I remember that Hazrat and Khan told my mother in confidence. He said, um, I have to protect people against my power. He said, I have to put a veil around myself because people wouldn't be able to stand the power that's coming through. Now, he had to do that, but um, he had to do that because he had to work in the world. But it's a restriction, like imagine the tremendous power of these beings. So um, there's a protection, and that protection is, well, there's no... As I said, there's no being in the world that you can't reach, I mean theoretically, but are you strong enough to reach that being? That's the problem. And so each one of us has some kind of connection with the hierarchy, but it's generally through a being who is in contact with another being who is in contact with a being in the hierarchy and so on. A lower being in the hierarchy who is in contact with a higher being in the hierarchy. That's the way the link is. And that's the meaning of the words of Christ, only through me you can reach the Father. It's a general term, uh, it's used, it wasn't only Christ who said that, I mean, uh, it's a thing that is said in the esoteric tradition, that you have to go through the, the lines of intercession, the, the ranks. Um, now, it's not altogether true, it's not true. You know, in the Catholic Church, for example, you're not supposed to jump the rungs of the ladder, like you can't go and uh, refer to the Pope. You have to ask first through the cardinals and so on, like in, exactly like in a government. Not at all 
the spiritual government of the world is not bureaucratic. I mean, it's not. Uh, you you can reach the top if you if you're strong enough. It's just a question of if it's not because of the rules. It's just if you are strong enough to do it, then you can. Now the link that joins the beings together, or that gives people access to the let's say, well, it's like. The, the Sufis use the word silsila, which means chains. It's like the chains of like the beings who are connected with the Christian tradition, and the beings who are connected with the Islamic tradition or the Hindu tradition, and so on. So, of course, these beings are far beyond the differences that people make between religions. But still, how can I say, maybe it's a little more like Alice Bailey says, he speaks of the different rays, different traditions. And so the different orders on the planet are attached to different traditions. So maybe you can, you are initiated in this order, and through this order you have a connection up, through, up to the top of the hierarchy. Or then in another order, maybe quite a different order. But as I said, there are differences. And... As Hazrat Inat Khan once said, unity does not mean uniformity. And what is more, as I said, um, there are moments when somehow one has the intuition of guidance. It can come in the form of protection. For example, there's a story of this girl who was just about to take a, a bus, and uh, all of a sudden she saw her a face of her grandmother who had died and uh, she had such a shock that she missed the bus and that bus had a crash and so well it's very clear that there was some intervention there and there are stories of people driving a car and all of a sudden they have the vision of an angel and it was just about at the time when they were going to sleep while driving and they would have had a crash so um, there are many cases of um, where there is the intervention of the guardian angel who helps one. Now one can have a warning of a of a master in one's in one's dreams, generally in one's dreams, at a moment, a difficult moment in one's life, and there definitely is. Um, perhaps one doesn't know it. One uh, one doesn't always remember one's dreams but somehow a message has been trying to come through. Or then there may be somebody who comes and tells you something, and uh, that person has been asked to well, give you a warning, and you don't. And perhaps that person doesn't even know why he's been asked to give you a warning. But somehow or other, you see, what I'm trying to get at is how this the communication is established between the government of the world, at least the in, non-incarnated masters and the and people in the world, how can you establish a contact? Imagine that the government can only function if the people will take in, heed of what it's trying to tell them to do, and so the government is only too happy when there's someone who's ready to respond. On the other hand, the government can only, uh, let's say, open, let's say, uh, reveal its strategy to people who are up to it, who are able to understand it and able also to keep a secret. So it's not very easy. Okay, now we're going to have our uh, break for quarter an hour.